Welcome everybody to Adult Catechism 2022. We are starting now lecture four of our second series on the sacraments. We're going to be looking at Holy Commun or Confession today. My apologies. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. Hello. In the beginning, yes, there we go. Wonderful. Mystery of Holy Confession. So we had a course in our first series of catechism on uh, on the doctrines that was dedicated to repentance. So I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time reiterating the orthodox view of repentance, which is very important. Um, and there's a lot to say about it even in this, but I just want to give a little brief kind of summary slash review of the concepts of repentance and orthodoxy as we go into holy confession. So first of all, for Orthodox Christians, repentance, I'll show you this quote. This, this quote here at the beginning is a quote I heard from, a, from when I was first starting out as a priest. Um, there was a, the local uh, tax preparer in town who was also the local televangelist. So I figured, well, this guy will know how to do clergy taxes, right? So I'll go to him. <laughs> and, and he called me up in his office and we were talking faith and stuff like that because he was a very evangelical minded guy. And he said, I got saved the old fashioned way. I repented. It's like, that's good. That's, I like that. I agree with that. Uh, but what do you mean by that? Repentance. Oh, I'm sorry. Misspelling. Repentance for us is a way of life. It's not just something you do once and you're good. Right, it's an ongoing way of life. This is uh, Saint Macarius the Great, and I think this might be Saint Macarius on the left. Repentance is the starting point and foundation of our new life in Christ. It must be present not only at the beginning but throughout our growth in this life, increasing as we advance. On reaching spiritual maturity, man becomes acutely conscious of his sinfulness and corruption, and his sense of contrition and repentance grows ever more profound. One would think that if you think of repentance as feeling bad about yourself, which it's not, by the way, uh, it's, it involves that as we realize when we've done things wrong. Um, but a lot of people think that Christianity is most, supposed to make you feel better, right? Well, it does. It gives you access to the most profound and holy joy you will ever know. But to get through that, you have to go through a crucible of repentance, and, and, and that is a deepening of your armor. Saint the F on the recluse, yes, who's a much later saint than Saint Macarius. And so uh, you'll hear the theme of repentance over and over again, especially right now, as we prepare for Holy and Great Lent, we're singing these wonderful hymns about repentance and these, these themes about repentance, like tomorrow is the Sunday of the Prodigal Son. As I said, repentance is not a one-time event. It's a, the lifetime struggle within us. Even after our baptism and our chris chrismation, it continues and in fact is, is amplified. You could say that the purpose of baptism and chrismation is to empower you to actually be able to fully repent. It's not the end of your repentance. It's to actually get you on the road to a long and meaningful repentance. In repentance, we struggle to deny ourselves and the passions not because we feel bad about ourselves, we're trying to please God in, uh, or earn his favor, I should say, um, or that we're trying to earn our way into heaven, but we love God and we want to please God because we love him. We want to drive sin out of our lives because we see the damage that it does to us. So repentance is, is a transformation from within. Even John Calvin understood this. And I like, to, I like to run down John Calvin quite often, I'm afraid. But he said, repentance is not merely the start of the Christian life. It is the Christian life. So let's take it from John Calvin today. And um, he approves as well. St. Theophon the Recluse again. The help of God is always ready and near, but only given to those who seek and work. Repentance is not something that's a passive emotional experience or just a feeling you have. If you have feelings when you're repenting, that's probably okay, but that's not the point. We, we're not maudlin, we're not about drowning in some kind of grief or mea culpas or something like that. We're, the, the, the feeling, the gift of tears is from the Holy Spirit, it's not something we try to affect, uh, but we allow it to happen to us. 
A sign of a Christian heart is that we respond with repentance and humility and even gratitude when someone points out our sins. Did you ever thank somebody for pointing out your failings? <laughs> is that the first instinct that you have? <laughs> or would you rather say something, something, something? Most of us probably don't feel particularly grateful if somebody calls us out for our sins. But a, a Christian who is in growing in repentance give thanks to God when this happens. Repentance involves a change of mind, heart, and life. That means a behavior, right? Way of life. The greater part of repentance is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We repent, we engage in repentance, we struggle to repent, but in the end, we even, even our repentance, we have to give the credit to the Holy Spirit acting within us. But we have our part to play because we have free will. We are cooperating with the life of the Holy Spirit within us. We are responding to those, those summons and those impulses from the Spirit to draw us closer to God. We ask God to strengthen our will to repent in our desire for righteousness. What was it that um, Augustine said? Lord, grant me to repent, just not yet, or something? <laughs> That's, that's a very immature thing to say. I don't think he meant that at the end of his life, but he probably meant that at the beginning, and probably most of us have gone through that. Um, we should ask God, grant us, grant us the strength to repent and, and come soon before our time is lost, because we don't know how long we have. And uh, as, as mentioned, we're coming up on Great Lent. We have Great Lent. We have Holy Nativity Fast, we have the Fast of the Apostles and the Fast of the Remission, plus our weekly Wednesday and Friday Fast uh, in the life of the Church. The purpose of these fasts, as we saw in the, in the, in the section on uh, communion, is to strengthen us, to bring us to repentance, to realize and teach us how little strength we have in ourselves, in our own wills, and that we need God's help. All right. So... A lot of times, um, people come from, if they come from traditions where confession is not a regular part of their practice, they may not realize that there's actually an incredibly rich and deep history of confession within the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, for that matter. And also in the New Testament, it's, it's, it's understood in many respects. And we're going to take a look at that in this next section. Do we have any questions before we go on about repentance? Just a comment. Yeah. The first of Luther's 95 theses said that our Lord Jesus Christ, when he said repent, you know, believe the gospel, meant for the whole life of man to be a life of repentance. So both Luther and Calvin taught that rent repentance was not a one and done. Thing. A one and done thing, right. So the fact that that attitude is widespread among some heirs of the Reformation today is actually a distortion of the original teaching of both Luther and Calvin. Yeah. And, and even to, and I don't know, I don't want to assume that, that there are people that really think that way, I don't, you know, but, but it does seem to be kind of an assumption that, oh, I don't have to do that anymore. You've been saved, right? So, and, um, I th but I think most people that study the scripture eventually kind of realize, oh yeah, that's, it's not really, <laughs> that's not really what the message is. So, okay, well, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning in the Torah. The book of Leviticus tells us many things. Most people don't study Leviticus. They think it's irrelevant now, but I'll tell you, Leviticus is chock full of goodness. Uh, Leviticus gives us all kinds of insights about the typology of the church and the fulfillment that comes in Christ and in the New Testament. And in Leviticus 5, we are given the law for the trespass or the sin offerings that the priest makes. The priest needs to know what it is that you did so that he knows what the appropriate sacrifice is to make. And note that um, there, there is a variety here. They're not just kind of kosher law issues or cultic issues. One is about making oaths. Another one is touching any unclean dead thing. Uh, another is just any uncleanness that might happen to you, which might include a, a sinful uncleanness. Or pronouncing an oath or swearing or speaking thoughtlessly, coming something from your lips, right? That can defile you. 
And it says, and it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing and bring his trespass offering. So there is a, there is a pathway to forgiveness for the sinner in the Old Testament through a sacramental life, through the priesthood, through the authority of the priest. That's a normative thing. And the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. He is, receives a cleansing with the sprinkling of the blood of the sacrifice uh, and so forth. So this idea that priests hear confession actually goes back to the Old Testament. In Numbers 5, we see that uh, it goes beyond that even. There is an understanding that there's penance or repentance that follows a confession and a sacrifice, and it's called restitution. So Moses, uh, the Lord speaks to Moses and commands, when a woman, man or woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord and the person is guilty, then he shall confess the sin he has committed, any sin. He shall make restitution of his trespass in full, plus one-fifth, a 20% uh, interest if you commit a sin in the Old Testament. So you have to, <laughs> you have to repay if there was a financial or monetary impact of your sin, right? You injured somebody's livelihood, you injured their animal, whatever it is. Uh, it's not quite clear here what it is um, because it could be anything, right? Uh, you shall give to the person you harmed the full repayment plus one-fifth to the person uh, that you have wronged. And even if that person is gone, you never see them again, you don't know who they were or they're dead, the commandment of the law still provides uh, a means for you to make restitution. And that is, if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest in addition to the ram of the atonement for, with which the atonement is made for him. So it's, it's given to the priest as the, store, as the representative of the storehouse of the people of God, right? So that's, that's one way. Now, um, uh, I don't charge interest on any of your sins when I hear your confessions, just so you know, that is, that is not continued on in the, uh, in the New Testament church. Sometimes people come and they will actually, they'll try to give me money after they hear my confession. I say, no, I'm not even allowed to take your money. That's, that's simonry, right? That's, that's, yeah. It's against the canons. They said, if you want to make a donation, put it in the candle stand, whatever, it'll go to the church. And that's fine, but don't 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 give the priest something for giving you communion or confession. That's not that's uh, that's not how it works. And of course, the one uh, which Jonathan mentioned previously in the in the talking about um, fasting before communion, the Day of Atonement tells us in Leviticus 16 that the high priest Aaron in the first place, and then later, of course, the high priest lays both his hands on the head of the goat, the scapegoat and confesses over the scapegoat all the iniquities of the entire people of God, and then sends the goat into the wilderness, right? So there is an act of communal confession that takes place on a yearly basis within the church. And that, in many respects, uh, is fulfilled in the New Testament uh, in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, who takes away the sins of the world, who, as we pray, you know, he takes our sins and nails them to the cross. And he suffers outside the camp, just like the scapegoat is sent out and so forth. So he is, he is both the, the sacrificial lamb, but he's also the scapegoat in the same type as well. In Leviticus 26, 40, God promises the blessings. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers and with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, that they have also walked contrary to me and that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, with Isaac and Abraham, I will remember the land. So God, um, again, calls us to repentance and that repentance includes uh, kind of a, a confession individually, but also communally as the people of God. And so when we come to confession, it's important to realize that we're not just doing, this is not just a personal individual sacrament, even though it's heard individually. When I come to confess my sins, I'm doing it for my salvation, yes, but I'm also doing it for the sake of the entire community. I'm being responsible to the entire church 
to the entire people of God to cleanse the iniquity from the land, to cleanse the sin in my life so that it doesn't come and infect and pollute my relationships with my fellow Christians, my relationship to the church and my faith, um, because that matters. That really does matter. And in the Didache, I could have found that, pulled that out. That, that was actually a major concern in, the, in that first century church, their Eucharistic discipline. I think it was in there in the, in the, in the earlier slides. Uh, one story that gives us a great example of this. There are consequences when we hide our sin. There are consequences when we don't come to confession and repentance. Uh, King David is, is well known for his repentance, right? He committed a major sin, double mortal sin, adultery with murder, right? By, by taking the wife of Uriah and setting himself to, up to be killed in battle. And he's, when he's confronted by Nathan, I won't read the whole thing, um, uh, David finally is, is uh, he, he calls David out and, and David realizes he's been kind of exposed and David, in verse 13 down here, David says to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So he confesses. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, your sin had consequences well beyond yourself and hurt many other people and brought shame upon the people of God, right? Uh, and, and so therefore the child also who is born to you shall surely die. God's judgment on David, unfortunately, takes the form of he loses his child. And Nathan departed to the house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and it became ill. It did not survive, right? Or did it? We'll have to see. Yeah, no, it's not a good thing. So we, we repent. But we should never assume that because we've confessed our sins or we've come to repentance, that that means we're out of the, the uh, what's the term? Out of the, out of the frying pan or whatever. We may still have to go through some fire, whatever. We, are, we still have to deal with the consequences of our actions. We still have to deal with the wreckage of our past actions. Um, and that's a really important thing. And David has to deal with it for the rest of his life. He has to sort out the problems in his family uh, until the day he dies, and it's still not really sorted out. Uh, and it continues for generations afterward, really, in many respects. So um, this is why we, when we pray, pray, don't leave anything out. Make sure that you confess everything so that you are not um, walk away unhealed. Another story that deals with confession in the Old Testament is in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra, it says, while Ezra was praying, while he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God, he's confessing his sins, but also the sins of his people, a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel, and the people wept very bitterly. They joined him in this group repentance. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, of course, you know who that is, right? You all know him. <laughs> spoke up and said to Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those who have been born to them. According to the advice of my master and those who tremble at the commandment of our God, let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. We also are with you. Be of good courage and do it. This is, this is hard repentance. They're saying we did wrong by marrying, intermarrying with the other religions and bringing paganism into our house and kind of diluting and defiling the people of God this way. This sounds very wrong to us in our politically correct day, right? How dare you suggest such a thing? But at that time, they understood that for the people of God to survive, for the faith to survive, they had to maintain a boundary between themselves culturally and the other cultures. That was the problem throughout that Old Testament. Over and over again, intermarriage led to idolatry. And so they just make a very hard decision that they're going to put away their wives. They're going to separate from them separate from that family, you know, divorce them. It doesn't, you know, I'm not sure if they just abandon them completely or whatever, but basically they, they put them in a difficult situation. Yeah. Father, what do you say to the 
discipline of the Orthodox Church in refusing to perform marriages between couples where one spouse would not be Christian and the other would be Christian is a way of sort of avoiding this sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 and we'll talk about that yeah. in the marriage class. Uh, but a similar a similar thing today would be you know young people or even elderly people are doing it more than ever before. People living in common law marriages, people living outside of a wedlock, people having children out of wedlock. This is a very frequent thing that's on the rise, in fact, in our culture. And, uh, you know, it doesn't set up a family for success and it doesn't set up a family to be successful in their, in their faith life, right? Because they're, they're living in, in sin. And uh, here's another story. Now we're into the New Testament. One of my favorite stories, the sons of Sceva, the Jewish exorcist. And uh, Jewish chief priest Sceva had seven sons and they decide, well, you know, there's these guys who are casting out demons pretty successfully in the name of Jesus. So they try to do it themselves when they encounter a uh, man with an evil spirit. And the evil spirit speaks from within the man saying, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And then he follows to beat, beat the snot out of all of them, right? And this became known to all the Jews and the Greeks, the pagans too, dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So the repentance involved in open public confession of their activity, and then followed with restitution acts in the form of burning their magic books, completely putting out all the things that were drawing them away from God and leading them into occultism, for example. And so they those who practiced magic brought their books, burned them together in the sight of all, and the total value of them totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That would That's an extraordinarily huge amount of money, even today. That's a huge amount of money. And, uh, you know, Repentance, confession might lead us to have to make a difficult decision in our life. Maybe we're in a relationship with a person that we need to distance ourselves from. Maybe we're engaged in a line of work that we need to distance ourselves from. Maybe we're just engaged in a lifestyle or, or a behavior or an addiction. And we feel like giving that up will be extraordinarily difficult or expensive to do. But that is what repentance very often calls us to do. And so, you know, just like um, we see in the Bible, sometimes the Lord teaches something like uh, if you want to be perfect, sell everything you have and follow me and, they, and the person goes away sad. Um, repentance does not, God is not asking us to give, for all of us to give everything we have away and, and, and come follow him. That's a, spe a, spe a special calling, right, to the monastic life or ascetic life and to a life of the perfection life, right, uh, which is what the young man wanted to find. And he was disappointed because he thought he could serve two masters, right? Have have his wealth, but also serve the Lord. Uh, for most of us, we're we're not going. We're, we're, our perfection will have to wait till after the grave. Nevertheless, we put away evil things. Repentance is taught um, very specifically by Saint John the Baptist, right? He comes as the teacher of repentance preaching, uh, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is exactly the same message Christ will take up after his baptism. And the people come from all around bap being baptized, confessing their sins. So they didn't come and just kind of sneak in and say, oh, please baptize me, John. It's, oh, you're good. Here you go, splish splash. Go have a nice life, right? It was not like that. It was like literally people weeping and realizing, confessing to God in, in front of everybody. I have, you know, publicans and harlots coming, confessing their sins and being restored to righteousness. John's baptism assumed that there was first uh, uh, a repentance involved. He also teaches, uh, in, we read in the Gospel of Luke, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't just come and say, you're sorry. Uh, start to live your life. And he, well, you know, ethic and an ethos that he gives. Uh, do not assume that because you're descended from Abraham, that you are a Hebrew or a Jew or what have you, that somehow that makes you entitled to the covenant life. You have to display 
a change of heart and uh, repentance and righteousness. Even now the axe is laid to the root. Every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We have to bear fruit. And the people uh, said, what shall we do then? And he goes on and for all people, he says, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. I have, I have three hoodies. I feel I like I might have to do something about that, but I love my hoodies. I, I really only wear one though, so I should probably I should probably give my other hoodies away. Yeah. Same thing here. Yep. I gave away my suits years ago because being a priest, I'm always wearing a cassock. So I gave away. I have like one suit. Uh, and the Lord Himself. Now this is moving into the authority given to the apostles starts with Peter, right? Because of his confession. Who do men say that I am? They say you're Elijah, one of the prophets, who knows? But who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say that you are Peter and on this rock, because Petros means the rock, the stone. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Because the church is going to batter down the, the gates of Hades with Christ. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So binding and loosing. Are the, are, the, are the keys here. Because sin is an entanglement and a captivity. You are being bound by the devil and enslaved to him when you engage in sin. So you must be freed. It's not just you're being forgiven like a debt. You also have to be released from your captivity. And so the ministry of the apostles began primarily with exorcisms and healings, which are releasing people from the bonds of their spiritual torment and also the physical torment that goes with it. The forgiving of sins just kind of follows naturally right out of that, right? That's kind of the least dramatic of the miracles, but it, uh, that's why Christ says, why do you think it's hard for the Son of Man to say, son, your sins are forgiven, but that you may believe, rise, take up your bed and walk, right? So he uses the miracle of the physical healing to demonstrate the lesser miracle of the forgiveness of sins. So it's a great miracle, but obviously not as dramatic. And then uh, later when he's talking to all of the disciples, uh, the apostles, and he's explaining to them how you must live, how you must be in accord with each other when you must be in agreement, etc. Uh, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his faults between you and him alone. So that's where you start, right? One, one on one. Don't call him out publicly. First, try to do it diplomatically. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he will not hear you, take, take two or three people with you, one or two more, so that at least other there will be a witness right so if you're like i've already talked to them they didn't really listen to me i'd appreciate maybe would you come with me and we can have a little mini intervention right and if he refuses to hear them tell it to the church then you have to kind of go and even then it wouldn't be like public announcement i would say talk to the authorities and so forth in the church the priest the bishop etc and if he refuses even to hear the church let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector so that's that's when somebody if they, if they won't receive the, the, the discipline or the correction of the church, they're said, okay, you're, you have to be away from communion with us until you accept. And assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this is a communal authority given to the church, not just to one individual or even to just the apostles. And later then, uh, after the resurrection, when Christ appears to them, uh, when uh, Thomas is not present, right, and Thomas comes later and so forth, Jesus said to them, Peace be unto you as the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Retaining sins is an interesting thing. It's saying you're not released. You are not loosed from the burden of that sin. You are still at risk 
from it and you are still accountable before God for it, meaning you can be judged for it. So it's a very serious thing to have that sin retained. Why, if we're Christians who love each other and don't want anyone to you know, suffer, why would the Lord give people the power to also retain sins? Notice, I give you the power to forgive sins, but also the power to retain sins, to say, not only are you forgiven, but also to say, are not forgiven. That's pretty scary stuff. That's power that emperors don't even have, as St. John Chrysostom points out. Why would he do that? Well, part of the reason is that you need that repentance, right? What is, uh, what was it that, um, who's the guy, the German, about easy grace? Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talked about Christianity without the cross, right? And easy grace and how, you know, unless you really understand suffering and you understand this whole stuff, I mean, yeah, it, cheap grace. yeah, cheap grace, right? It's, 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 and, and, and it doesn't help if you just say, Hey, you're forgiven. Don't worry about it. Go. But the person hasn't actually gone through any kind of repentance. They're just going to fall right back into it. First of all, nine times out of 10 minimum. And second of all, they're, they're, they haven't learned from it. You've actually taken away from them the opportunity to, uh, to grow. The Holy Spirit blows where it wills. The door just opened on its own. <laughs> so retaining sins is actually part of, part of what's a healing ministry. St. Paul will say elsewhere, a really stunning thing where he'll say, uh, I surrender this, surrender this one who won't listen to Satan for the correction of their soul, the, for the destruction of their flesh. So let the devil go to town on them so that their soul may be saved, so that they'll finally realize, hey, what did I get myself into? And sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes even as clergy, you have spiritual children who's, who decide, you know what? I don't care what the church says. I'm going to go do what I want to do, right? <laughs> I'm going to live my life and all that. And you say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not here to make your life miserable, but I can't give you communion. I can't pretend that it's okay what you're doing. You, I've explained it. You understand. If you, that's what you want to do, I'm not going to let you come to communion because that would be a bad witness, right? And that's not good for your soul. And either they understand it or they don't. Uh, usually they're mad either way. And uh, maybe they don't talk to me for a while. But very often, life happens. They grow a little more mature. They get beaten up a little bit around the block. They go the prodigal son way, right? And they, they find themselves in want. And they and eventually they come back and they say, you know, I think, yeah, I'm, I think I'm ready. And some people don't. Some people leave the church forever and they figure, I don't need it, whatever. Uh, no one's going to judge me. And uh, God help them. God help them. We don't do it ever um, with any kind of fun. I mean, it's, it's always like, you know, it's like saying, I'm sorry, I have to give you chemo, you know, or I'm sorry, I have to do surgery. And uh, some people say, no, thanks. And it's, it's very rough. But for the most part, very often, we don't. It's very rare. Very rare. Uh, but sometimes it does happen. This communal and personal confession practice that we see in the Old Testament continues in the New Testament. St. James says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another, one another that you may be healed. The effect, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And he goes on to talk about Elijah. Uh, we confess our sins to God. We confess our sins to a priest, but we can even confess our sins to one another and pray for one another. Um, they're all meant to be done. They shouldn't be one in place of the other, like one is good enough for one replaces the other. It's something we can all do. And actually, when we come to Forgiveness Sunday, which is a beautiful Sunday coming up in about two weeks, yeah, on March 6th, I think, we have what's called the Ceremony of Mutual Forgiveness. And one of the practices of that, it's one of the most beautiful times of the year is that everybody who stays comes and, and we kind of line up. And one by one, everybody goes in front of everybody other, every other person in the church and says, Brother, forgive me, a sinner, and bows down before them. And the other person says the same thing. No, forgive me, a sinner. Brother, sister, forgive me, a sinner. And then they embrace and say, God forgives and I forgive. 
And it's a conf- it's a mutual confession and a prayer for one another that happens. And it's, it's beautiful, filled with grace. It's a wonderful experience. Yeah. Father, when people read that ver- those verses from James, I think they sometimes read it out of context because right before that, in verses 14 and 15, it's pray, ask the it's elders like, to pray for you. Right, yeah, it, it says if, if someone is sick, yep. they should call on the presbyter for you know, the elders of the church to come and pray for them and anoint them with oil. And if they've sinned, you know, their, their, their sins will be forgiven. Their sins will be forgiven. There's, yeah, so the, so it's, it's part and parcel of the ecclesiastical sacramental life of the church. And we'll talk more about uh, anointing as well, which is also a forgiving sacrament. All the sacraments forgive sins. Uh, in Psalm 32, we, we read, I acknowledge my sin to you, my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. A person could read this and say, see, that's all I have to do. I confess my transgressions to the Lord, and my iniquity was forgiven. Um, and sometimes that's that might be the case, but God has also given us the ministry of the church for these purposes and commanded us to come because it's not just about an up and down relationship individually. We're part of this community. We're part of the shared life in Christ and uh, the church, we support each other. In 1 John uh, chapter 1, John calls us to this kind of this awakening of, of repentance in us. If we say we have fellowship with him, but we walk in darkness, we lie. And do, this is always hard for me to read. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive, our, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we, we're lying if we say uh, we, we have... Um, and do not if we do not walk in darkness, but if we say we have no sin, we're also lying, right? So how do you reconcile those two things? How do you not walk in darkness yet recognize that you have sin? You walk in the light through confessing your sins. You don't keep your sins in the dark. You don't keep your sin, sins hidden. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So don't even try that, right? I'm good. I'm, I don't have any sins. <laughs> you know, uh, don't put in the basket. I'm alive and doing fine. Sign signs everywhere. The signs. It's an old reference. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we see, and I won't read it here at, at length that a lack of repentance is a clear sign of those who are damned going into the end times, right? The people who did not repent of their murders, did not repent of their immoralities, their sorceries, their thefts, they did not give God glory, they blasphemed the Lord, the God of heaven, uh, and they did not repent of their deeds, even when they were suffering the plagues, even when they were suffering. And this is the thing that that, you know, I think I've seen, you know, I think we have all seen a lot of people coming to faith over the pandemic because they kind of realized what maybe there's something that they need to address. You know, maybe a, a little a little bit of danger was enough to draw them a little closer to God and say, hey, I need I need to be closer to you, Lord. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people who are going to come out of this just as wicked as they ever were. And that's the, sadly the truth, right? They're going to come out and they're going to be just as mean and nasty and maybe worse, right? Because now they really don't give a darn about anybody else. They're like, I'm done. Well, be wise. Read the book of Revelation. See what happens to those folks when, when they're faced with the judgment of God and don't, don't repent and give God glory. Okay. So, let's see. It's 4.10... We can, we can start, I don't know, we might get through all of this. I wanted to talk about how we actually do confession and what the right of confession actually looks like. Now that we've looked at the background of it and the kind of the scriptural worldview around it, how do Orthodox Christians do this? First of all, you got to prepare. If you're going to come to confession, 
you know, do it, do it with some intention, with some forethought, the more, just like with communion, the more you prepare for liturgy and the more you prepare yourself to receive Holy Communion, the more grace you're going to feel and experience and, 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 and have in your life. It's not because you're earning it, it's because you're just attuning yourself to it. The same is true with confession. The more you prepare yourself through self-examination, through prayer, even before you go into confession, asking God to help you see your sins, uh, the more you're going to get out of it. So uh, note your sins. Confess them to God in your personal prayer, but then bring them to the priest for absolution. It's uh, important to note that a person can act and think and feel forgiven, but not be forgiven. Oops, sorry about that. Go back. Right? I, you know, I confessed my sins, but maybe I haven't really done the restitution that I need to do. Maybe I haven't made myself accountable to anybody else. It's kind of like the parallel I like to say is, you know, a burglar steals the home, feels really bad about it, and says, goes into the middle of an empty field or a woods and cries out, I'm guilty, I did it, and walks away and, you know, pats himself on the back. It doesn't really count, right, until you've gone to the station and turned yourself in. And when we come to confession, that's exactly what we're doing. We're coming before uh, the throne of glory, the throne of the judge, and we're saying, I am guilty. And I'm guilty of this, and this, and this, and this. And we're not just uh, hoping we got away with it. Sacramental confession and penance are part of the cleansing process. In the uh, Gospels, we hear the story of the ten lepers, who God, uh, who Christ healed, and he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. But they weren't fully cleansed until they went to the priest. Now, there was one of them who was a Samaritan. He couldn't go to the priest. So what did he do? He came back to Christ, who is the ultimate priest, right? The high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And there he thanked God, and he was still cleansed, even though he couldn't fulfill the law as it was, because he was not, he was a Samaritan, and, and and Christ commended him because he did what none of the others did, which was to come back and give thanks. So he had even higher cleansing, so to speak. Uh, saint Tikhon of Zadansk, a, a fairly modern saint from the 18th, 19th century. He's the patron saint of the monastery of Saint Tikhon in uh, South Canaan, Pennsylvania, where I went to seminary. He wrote, there's more mercy in God than there are sins in us. Confess your sins at once, whatever they may be. We read elsewhere, you know, more, uh, our sins may be more than the sands of the sea, yet God's grace is the ocean, right? So the sand is swallowed up and washed away. In confession, we first confess our weak repentance because we repeat the same sins and we show our lack of resolve. 99% of the time when we come to confession, we're going to be confessing the same things we confessed the last time. And some people think that that it's like, oh, well, what's the point? Well, I'll tell you, it's a lot better that you're confessing that than you come up with a whole batch of new stuff. I would be worried for you if you came and, well, I tried out some new stuff this month, Father. <laughs> no. We are, we, each of us has a particular set of struggles that will be, uh, you know, we all have the general passions, the general sins, the general temptations. And each one of us will probably have particular ones that are particularly acute for us. You know, the alcoholic has his particular obsession with drink. The, uh, the workaholic might have their idea. The person who's extremely vain, you know, concerned about their looks and how people think of them, you know, each... Each person has their own particular character flaws that will repeat over and over again. And as we go, those will come up, but we'll also kind of peel back layer by layer and uh, get to the deeper stuff as well. If a habitual sin is there, keep confessing it. Don't be ashamed to confess it. Come forward. And uh, in time, you might be able to get rid of it or diminish it. Um, that's the goal, and there are the tools that are given in confession and the Holy Fathers, the teaching of the Fathers, uh, that help us to get better at that. But don't expect perfection. You know, there's some people who are like, I just gave it up and never went back. 
never look back. Well, thank God. Give, give thanks to God for that if you can do that. But most of us are kind of kind of venial sins. They're just part of our fallen nature and our, and our, and our fallen character. And they come back over and over again, our short tempers, our impatience, our bad language, whatever it is. The liturgical services and prayers of the church are there to help instill within us a spirit of repentance, to, to remind us of what holiness and beauty and truth and goodness are, so that we'll, oh, yeah, I'm not, I'm far from that. I need to, I need to draw myself closer to it. Have a loose neck. <laughs> Be pliable, be willing to learn and to be led, to be corrected. Don't have a stiff neck. Don't be proud in your, in your sinfulness. Uh, and, and, and also, don't think that a big mistake people make when they come to confession is thinking, if only I had stronger willpower, I would be better at this. I would do better. And then they get frustrated and angry about that. Um, that's actually not how it works. It's, it's by stopping, depending on your own will, and trusting in the will of God and asking God for help that you'll actually make any progress whatsoever. Um, for some of us, that can be very difficult. Again, there's dangers of unconfessed sins. St. Siloan, who's a modern saint, we must always remember that the Lord sees us wrestling with the enemy, so we must never be afraid. Even should all hell fall upon us, we must be brave. Uh, he also says, uh, you know, God loves a, God loves a, um, a, a, a brave warrior, you know, a brave fighter. And that's, that's what we need to be when we're doing. So don't be afraid to confess your sins. Don't be too ashamed. Bring them boldly before the throne of grace. Any dark spot in your life on which the light of Christ does not shine is territory that you've ceded to the demons. We say, well, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about this. It's too embarrassing. It's too difficult. It's too painful. Then you're giving the devil kind of free reign there to continue to harass you from that position. It's like leaving a flank undefended in your life or a window open through which a burglar can come in. Unconfessed sins are a launching pad for demonic attacks on your soul and your body. It can cause you great stress, and great trouble. And as AA says, you are only as sick, sick as your secrets. Sometimes, sometimes just being able to say something that you never said to anybody else, admitting something that you were never able to say out loud, uh, can be extraordinarily healing. Can just like depressurize decades of shame in an instant. It's incredible. It's very powerful. So. Don't hide. Come before the throne of glory, the throne of grace. Now, there are things not to do, false solutions to our sins. Don't say, I haven't sinned. I'm basically a good person, <laughs> you know, or, or I don't really have any, I don't really have anything to say this time, Father. There's, not, there's, not, there's sometimes people say that. Um, rather say, I just don't know. I, I know I have sins. Um, you know, I know I'd fall short. I can't think of anything that's like particularly weighing on my conscience. That's, that's not denying. It's just kind of being unaware at the moment, but that's okay. That's confessing ignorance. That's, that's, that's also one of the things we should confess. Don't rationalize. Sometimes people will want to tell me the story of why they did what they did. Well, I just want you to understand the context, Father. I'm like, I, I don't need to hear. The, I don't need to hear the drama. I don't need to hear what everybody said to you and did to you and how they've done it for years and years. This is not about them. Don't confess other people's sins. Come and say, you know what? I have a problem. I don't forgive this person or I keep getting upset about something they're doing or saying to me or somebody I work with or whatever. And that is on me. That's on me that I have a problem. That's my problem. If I was at peace, they, they could roll a boulder over me and it would just bounce off. Privatization. Well, I did. It didn't, it didn't really hurt anybody. So why talk about it? Or it's not really anybody's business, it's not the priest's business. <laughs> no, it's not my business. I don't really want to hear it. <laughs> I'm there to be a witness on behalf of God. I'm, 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 I'm there to be your advocate before the throne. So you share, you share with your defense lawyer 
um, um, I'm your, I'm your, your, what's his name? Saul Goodwin from better breaking off bad. <laughs> this is a terrible, <laughs> terrible example of a defense attorney, but nonetheless, I'm there to help you. Uh, forgetfulness. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, forgetfulness. One of the things that happens is sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll be confessing for many years even, and then you'll remember something that happened years ago that you never confessed. And you go, oh, should I confess that? I mean, God forgave me all my sins that I don't remember or that I didn't know about. And I, because we do that actually in the prayer, I'll show you. Um, but that's okay. If something comes, it's often a chance. It's either the devil trying to tempt you with despair or shame, but God may be allowing that remem that memory so that you will come to a deeper repentance and come to an opportunity for restitution. Maybe you're like, oh, you know what? I forgot. I, I, I took something from someone years ago. I, I said I would give it back, and I never have. Now I don't, maybe I don't even know where they are or whatever. And we'll talk about it. We'll figure out, like, how could, you, how could you pay that forward, so to speak? Maybe do something for somebody else if you can't find the original person. Maybe the original person doesn't care. But just that you know and that you become sensitive to it, it's a good thing. It's you're growing in your, in your faith. Three people you never lie to, your lawyer, your doctor, and your priest. That's right. Thank you, Hank. Uh, because your, your priest is your lawyer and your doctor before God. And your doctor, you often treat like a priest, right? And some people treat lawyers, and we do. They, we, get, we get treated the same, by like we have some special power from on high, which in the case of the priesthood, we kind of do. So uh, the nuts and bolts are rather the nails and bolts of confession. Orthodox Christians practice now private confession, but it's not anonymous, okay? So the priest knows who you are. You confess face-to-face -face or side-by-side. -side. You're usually facing the, the, the cross or an icon of Christ or the book of the Gospels or all three. It might be in front of everybody, but the conversation that you have is private and said in a low voice so only the two of you can hear. It's usually not done in an enclosed area. I have a little side room that I do, but it's but you know it's with windows and stuff, so that if people, you know, people can see you, or you can leave the door open if you feel like it. Um, the priest will usually say a prayer before you give your confession, usually to the effect of you know, don't be ashamed or embarrassed to confess anything to me. It's not to me you're confessing, but to the Lord who hears your confession. Uh, the penitent may offer a prepared confession. Some people will come with a with a, a list that they've written. I call it kind of the laundry list approach. Um, don't over dramatize that. I had I had a, I had a person I won't mention the name who had been a, a person involved in theater at one point in their life, and when they wrote their confession, it was like a dramatic monologue. It was quite pleasing to the ear. It was quite a performance. But eventually, I had to say, "Stop! You're performing." And I know that's your nature, and that that's what you're used to. But but just be, be just break it down. Be raw. Come before God, and from your heart, speak. Don't prepare words that are that. You know, make a list, but don't prepare this monologue. It's not it's not good. Um, if you don't know what to confess, you know, I'll ask you. A lot of kids come. Little kids will come. It's their first time confessing, and I go through a standard kind of list of things. How, should, how do you listen to your mommy and your daddy? Do you, do, how do you get along at school with the kids? Do you listen to your teacher? And basically, um, we're not that different from children. So it's the same kind of thing. Are you getting along with your family, with your spouse, with your, at work? You know, where, where are you struggling? Where do you talk to God? Do you pray? You know, I'll ask you through the questions. I won't go through a whole list of like, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you, some people do that, but I, I, that's kind of old school and I don't like that. It's a little too, I don't know, prying, but it, I think it's a, I think your job is to do that homework ahead of time. Go through those lists, kind of. But one time somebody actually had a list, another story, uh, and they checked off the ones that they that they did. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's that's good. And then I went through and I showed them how by doing all those things, they did everything else on the list as well, at least metaphorically. So keep it within a Keep it within the understanding that it's not about, I only did this, I didn't do this. You know, it's like, well, you know, anytime we have a harsh thought in our hearts towards somebody, we've participated in the energies of murder. Anytime we wanted something that didn't belong to us, we've participated 
somehow in the spirit of theft, right? So that's the Ten Commandments are to be understood on a deep level, not just on the most obvious level. Uh, the priest will give you appropriate guidance. I might give you penance and, of course, absolution. A penance would be something like, um, I fought with my neighbor, you know, I, I, I lit a bag of poop and put it on their front porch or something. Most people don't do that nowadays, but that can happen. I did something right. I did something to somebody or said something about somebody. And, you know, maybe there's a penance involved. Maybe it's like, okay, but before you come to Holy Communion, do something to fix that, you know, make them a nice pie. Not like in the, that one movie, make them a real good pie. Make them, give them a gift, do something, show them a kindness, mow their lawn, something. We'll figure it out. You know, we come up with, with an with a appropriate kind of act of restitution to those who have been wronged. Uh, we do have at St. Mary's what's called group confession. Group confession is a group, ex, a group prayer before confession and a group examination of conscience. Uh, we'll have one coming up in a couple of weeks, probably at the end of maybe March 13th, we'll do it. Um, or March 12th. And that usually takes from the writings of the saints like St. Basil, St. John of Kronstadt, St. Ephraim the Syrian, other great ascetic fathers. And you get to hear how they confessed their sins. And when you hear how the saints confess their sins, you'll be like, oh man, <laughs> I don't even, I'm not even going to get close to that. So I kind of say, if you want to, if you want to make their confession your confession today, then come forward boldly bow your head before the Lord and we'll say the prayer of absolution because it covers everything. It covers everything. And uh, it it's, gives an opportunity for if I have 40 or 50 people coming for confession, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that easily one at a time, hearing the whole thing one at a time because each one of those could take five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes. There's no way I can get through that many people. So group confession is a great opportunity, first of all, to hear what you should be confessing, because you hear it from the saints, to expedite the confession process when it's, when, you know, you're kind of like, I know it's time, I need to prepare. Maybe there's nothing super weighing on my heart, or there's like, I don't anticipate a major penance. If you've cheated on your spouse, or you've stolen something, or you've really punched somebody in the face some way, don't come to group confession come to personal confession, come to individual confession. If it's, you know, it's, it, it's been, a, it, you've been doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, uh, you know, and you're falling short in all the kind of like the, the venial sins, the, the minor sins and so forth. Um, group confession is, is sufficient for that. And each person is individually receives absolution. And remember, if there is something that isn't mentioned that you did do some, one of these major sins, uh, that's not included in that absolution. So don't assume it is. Don't assume you're covered from that. The seal of confession is very important. <clears throat> the seal of confession means that whatever you say to the priest when he hears your confession is under a seal. It's, it's, it's closed like a, like a file that has been sealed, right? The spiritual father in a parish setting is different than in a monastic setting. In a monastic setting, people come to confession maybe weekly or even more often if they need to. They're there confessing everything, their thoughts, what they're thinking about during the day. Because in the monastic setting, they're being taught how to pray without ceasing. So they're undergoing a discipline of extraordinary mental prayer uh, and prayer of the heart that, that, that requires very deep confession on a regular basis. They're also under strict obedience because that's the life. It's like a military life, right? You go here, you do that. Your obedience is go say this many prayers, go do this many things, go clean the chapel, do this, do that, whatever. That's monastic life. Some people think it's a really exciting idea to go to a monastery and have, a, have one of these elders or monks hear their confession. Realize that if you do that, you are putting yourself under the same kind of an obedience. And if they say, oh, you did this, three years penance. You don't come to conf you know you're like whoa what wait a my priest at home never said anything about that's that's be forewarned they may do that they're very strict some people like that some people want that that's fine just realize the uh, one of the big issues is that there are some monasteries well where, where they have a different standard of receiving converts 
So let's say you were a Roman Catholic and you were received into the church by chrismation. They may say, oh, that's not good enough. You should have been baptized. And they'll say, you can't take communion until you're baptized. And, Wait a second, my priest received me this way. Well, now you're under their obedience for doing that. And the only way to get out of that is to basically appeal to your bishop. Because only the bishop has that authority over that to, to, to kind of absolve you, loose, loosen you from that uh, anathema, so to speak. So be careful. Go, don't go chasing waterfalls. Listen to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. So the seal of confession, confession is completely confidential, both for the priest and for the one who has received absolution. That is to say, you are not bound to tell what the priest told you to anybody. You're not required. Now, if you do, um, I don't want you to think like you can. Like maybe the priest said something to you, like you're under penance for five, ten years, and you don't know what to do. So you go, what do I do? You have to talk to somebody. Talk to another priest or a bishop, maybe. But in particular, it's not something like, I, did, I went to confession. Father said I had to do this. Oh, well, he didn't tell me this. He told me this. And people to start comparing their penances. That is not how it works, okay? You might talk to your friend and say, I went to Dr. So-and-so and he gave me a prescription for so-and-so, for such and such. I want to get that prescription too. <laughs> I'm going to go to the doctor. And then the doctor says, I've looked over your x-rays and your file and everything, and I recommend that you go straight to the hospital. Well, this is the same kind of situation. Don't go to the same priest assuming that you're going to get the same prescription for healing. You're one person. The other person is another person. They have a whole other history and a whole other life behind them and a whole other personality. What I give as a penance is, is, is there for you, the healing of you. You may not be able to handle what they can handle. Or they may not be able to handle what you can handle. So you've got to be ready to receive what's given to you. Whatever you say to me, I don't say to anybody. People, people often, because we have a married priesthood and right, and and um, and I have a wife. A lot of times, people think that whatever they say to me, I tell my wife, even outside of confession. I'm here to tell you, I don't tell my wife anything about anything. I come home and I don't want to talk about work. <laughs> And I don't talk about what people say to me, even outside of confession, on the off chance that something they say may relate to something they confess. So I treat any private conversation that I have with anybody in the same way as, as that kind of the same like a lawyer's privilege or a doctor's privilege, the same kind of thing. What's that? Like a HIPAA kind of thing? Like an, well, I'm not under the law of a HIPAA, but, uh, but, the, but the seal of confession I treat, pretty much anything a person is going to tell me is private, unless it's something that obviously I have to share with somebody because to process something. So don't go to my wife and say, but, you know, Father, this and this, she's not going to have any idea what you're talking about because I don't tell her and I don't tell anybody else. Uh, again, penances are tailored to each person, just as prescriptions vary by patient. Okay, so we're getting to the end of our time, but I'm going to try to push through. So here's a prayer that a priest might say. Behold, my spiritual child, Christ stands invisibly here receiving your confession. Do not be ashamed, neither be afraid and hide nothing. Rather, do not be afraid to tell all that you have done so that you may receive forgiveness from our Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, his holy icon is before us. I am only the witness, bearing testimony before him of all that you shall say. But if you conceal anything, you shall have the greater sin. Take heed, therefore, that having come to the divine physician, you do not, uh, you not, do not depart unhealed. Right. So again, come, say what you have to say. Um, th this this lesson can be the scariest, I think, for people who are coming into the church because they're like, "You want me to do what? I like the church service. I like the liturgy. I love the communion idea. I love the baptism. But you want me to do what? You want me to tell you?" my deepest, darkest secrets and things like that. And some people can't. They might be under some kind of, uh, maybe they want to confess something because they're in government service and they really can't. Uh, so so we're, I'm sensitive to that. I don't, know, I don't need to know the details. I'm really good with euphemisms. You can, you can talk around it and I'll get, I'll get what you're saying without you revealing stuff. Uh, after you say what you have to say and we have the conversation that we have, 
we come to the point which is the actual prayer, uh, which is the sacrament itself, right? The prayer of absolution. There are two main forms of absolution within the Orthodox Church rubrical books. One is the Slavonic form, the other is the Byzantine form. I'll start with the Slavonic form because you may be, uh, it may be more familiar to you. O Lord God, the salvation of your servants, merciful, compassionate, long suffering, who repent concerning our evil de deeds, not desiring the death of a sinner, but that they should turn from their evil ways and live. Show mercy now in your servant, grant to them the image of repentance, forgiveness of sins and deliverance, pardoning all their sins, either voluntary or involuntary. You'll hear this at group confession, for example. Reconcile and unite them to your holy Catholic and apostolic church through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom you are due all dominion and majesty now and ever. And then there's two ways of saying the prayer itself. May our Lord Jesus Christ, by the grace and compassion of his love for mankind, forgive you, my child, Jonathan, all your transgressions. Or I, his unworthy priest, through the power given me, forgive and absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that is not typical within orthodoxy historically until quite recently, 1642 and onwards, because that is the Latin form. That's the ego te absolvo. I forgive you. You might have heard the news that came out this week about a priest in some mm -hmm. diocese that was doing baptisms saying, we baptize you, and they ruled that his baptisms were invalid. This is, this is mind boggling to me as an Orthodox priest, because first of all, it's neither we nor I from the Orthodox point of view. Christ is always the officiant of the sacrament. And when we baptize, we never say, I baptize you, or we baptize you. We say, you are baptized in the name. So I don't know what that means for us, because they accept our baptisms as valid in the Catholic Church. So these poor people are being told that their baptisms are invalid because they didn't say, I baptize, but we don't even do that. So just their baptisms as anything, any sacrament that follows from it, that, that assume they were baptized. It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. I'm sorry. The, to put those people through that, it's just, it's just in a good example of the difference in worldview, like the legalism in the West versus the kind of the common sense uh, economia and acrovia within the, in the East making sense. And then we say, now having no further care of the sins, you have confessed a part of peace, knowing that your sins are as far as the East is from the West, or have no fear of your sins, right? But typically, that's kind of the Slavonic form. Byzantine form. My spiritual child who have confessed to my humble person, I humble and a sinner, have not power on earth to forgive sins but God alone, but through the divinely spoken word which came to the apostles after the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven, whosoever sins you retain are retained. We are emboldened to say, this is that uh, anamnesis of the words of institution, right? Whatever you have said to my humble person, whatever you have failed to say, either through ignorance or forgetfulness, bracket, not because you chose to hide it, okay, that's not included, through ignorance or forgetfulness, whatever it may be, may God forgive you in this world and in that which is to come and in the world to come. And then that's usually the, all the prayer that I say for the prayer of forgiveness, because that's what's in the Romanian rubrics. Uh, some rubrics also include the prayer and may God who pardoned David through Nathan the prophet when he confessed his sins, Peter who wept bitterly for his denial, the harlot weeping at his feet, the publican and the prodigal, may our same merciful God forgive you all things through me a sinner, both in this world and in the world to come. Maybe somebody will come some, someday come and say, well, Father David didn't say the second half, so all the confessions I ever did were invalid. Um, that may happen someday, but I hope to God I'm dead if that does, because that would be really dumb. <laughs> now having further no care of these sins. The fact is, the priest has said the prayer of forgiveness. It's not about the form. Here's my point. There's multitudinous forms of how to say the liturgy. Okay, there's multitudinous forms of how to say the prayer of absolution. The point is, the person who is rightly empowered to do it is doing it with words that make sense. There's, it's not about the the legal form of it, right? It's not a legal transaction. It's a spiritual reality. Yeah, you had a question? Um, in in uh, the Orthodox Church, for catechumens, do you have a uh, forgiveness for them where they have a, what's called a life confession before? Yes, we're about to talk about that. Okay. Um, but 
what what I don't think I have in here is that for the first time a person is coming and being received, the baptism itself is the prayer of absolution for them, right? It's the forgiveness of their sins. So there's no, if they come to confession before baptism, there's no absolution said at that time. The baptism itself is the absolution. The bap yeah, there's no reason to do a, a prayer of absolution and then do the baptism. Clean, yeah. baptized, right? Baptism is this clean slate. So chrismation, likewise, if a person is being received by chrismation only, mm -hmm. there is a prayer of absolution in that service of okay. chrismation, uh, so, which is before the chrismation. Okay. So the priest wears a stole, the, what do we call epitrochelion, which is a fancy Greek word for thing around the neck. <laughs> it's literally what it means. Uh, it represents the authority to act in Christ's name, the, the yoke, you know, of, of Christ. And it can bring the sinners the certainty of forgiveness. Children start going to confession as soon as they have an awareness of the burden of their sins. Typically, it's around age seven to eight. For some kids, it's younger. For some kids, it's older. And when they do, they'll start coming maybe a couple times a year only when they're young, maybe at Easter and Christmas and things like that. And as they get older, they, they'll start to come with their parents more often. But we kind of, we work them into, into this system, so to speak. Uh, the Lord wants to bear the burden of our sins. That's why he came, right? To, to nail them to the cross. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the yoke of confession that the priest wears is, and then also placed on you is that is that rest that you get in his forgiveness. Converts typically make a life confession before being received. This can be a, a complete inventory of their life, a summary of the major spiritual wounds that they bring to Christ for healing. Um, we have guidance on how to do that, what you want to go through. I remember when I get, I always remember when I do my life confession, I, uh, I've done it like three times now because I had different reasons to do it each time. But um, the first sin I can remember was when I was like two or three years old, when I donked a kid on the head with a toy. And I was like, what's going to happen if I drop this thing on his head? Let's see. Boom. And he starts crying. And I was like, oh. I probably shouldn't have done that, right? And I remember that to this day. I could oh picture goodness. that memory. And I, whenever I start my life confessions, I would always start with the first confession. The first thing I remember is this. And that's like Cain and Abel. <laughs> my first sin. It gets a lot worse from there. <laughs> uh, for some people, maybe they've already come uh, through a tradition that had a lot of confession involved in it, okay? I don't want somebody to feel like they have to drag everything back out. Um, that's not necessary. But what I would say is as you're coming to conversion in the faith, you're bringing kind of who you are and you want to highlight the major kind of events in your life, the kind of major traumas and spiritual scars of your sins so that when you know the things that's that still impact you there are some things you'll be like oh yeah i forgot to confess that because it's been fully healed before you even came that's fine i don't need to know everything it doesn't have to be like uh uh chunk in the goonies start at the beginning it's another great movie if you haven't seen that baptism and chrismation bestow on us a garment of white we are clothed in christ but sometimes our white clothes get a little dirty i've got a white shirt on underneath and I noticed a couple spots today and I thought I should probably go to confession. Subsequent confessions are short accounts of what's happening in the moment in the, in the current time period and they're God's solution for post baptismal sins and renewing our baptismal garment. Now the truth is that in the ancient world confession, the sacrament of reconciliation and all this was really kind of a, uh, a, a thing for major penances. Somebody who fell away from their faith or committed uh, apostasy or murder or sorcery or, or idolatry right uh, and there was there was no other there there was you know no way for them to go to communion on after that so they had besmirched their baptismal garments kind of irrevocably and so the church said no there is hope there is forgiveness and it's through this ministry and so people might not go to confession once a month or every six weeks in the ancient world. Maybe it was only for major things. But you also remember, they were living in a much different context in which like 
the life or death quality of their faith was ever present, right? You know, being a Christian could get you killed, right? So, so they were playing with higher sticks. So the idea of like going to confession once a month to confess that you were upset about the, the dog chewing your mail, you know, it's not like what they were dealing. They were dealing with serious demonry in the culture around them. Um, likewise, you know, now we live in a different time. So, you know, we're dealing with our kind of more everyday sins. We don't see the, the high stakes that maybe that they saw. But for us, it's good for us because we get very lackadaisical. We get very negligent. We forget the price that it cost for the faith to survive to our generation. We forget how many people died to maintain the faith, lest it be extinguished from the earth. And so, yeah, maybe we come to confession a little more often. Maybe, maybe we, that's our martyrdom, okay? Maybe that's what we have to go through. Thus, conversion is a lifelong experience rooted in ongoing repentance, that regular, seasonal, whatever you want to call it, confession that we do, that's part of that ongoing repentance. A true confession is from the heart. It's not a rote recitation of general sins. It shouldn't feel that way. If it feels that way, you're not doing it right. It should be a personal confession of our unique and particular sins. And it is rooted in the belief that we are sinners completely in need of God's mercy and help. Here's a nice image of what happens in confession. Your angel draws near, the Holy Spirit comes down, and the devil pulls away. I had a, a icon I had posted on Facebook today that shows a person giving confession and all this weird green viney tentacly stuff is coming out of their mouth. And I assume the icon is meant to be like your sins being dragged out of you. But I made the comment, this is to show that you should not eat too many bean sprouts during Great Lent, lest you burst forward verdantly. <laughs> Nonetheless, stuff comes out of you. It's gross. It's I, I, you know, people ask me, what, is, what does the priest do? I say, I am God's garbage man. I am God's sanitation worker. Honest to God, that's the most important work that I do is I take out the trash and I clean up the mess. I wipe up your vomit so that you can be cleaned. That's my job. So if you want to you know what the honor of the priesthood is, go work as a sanitation worker, and then you'll know. That's what it means. When you come to confession, desire to get better and believe that you can and will with God's help. We don't do it just, I mean, most of us will see very little progress in some parts of our life, but others will see progress over time. I've seen some amazing progress in people. People who are hard-hearted, angry, resentful, become gentle as doves. They become those people that they thought they'd never be, right? They look at these people, they said, that person, that's a good Christian. I'm not one of those people. And slowly but surely, the rough edges are smoothed, and they become, they become lambs of Christ too. It's amazing. It takes time. Hate your sins in the sense of, you know, want to cast them out. The gospel says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Almost all English translations get this wrong because they think that this is about heaven suffering violence and being taken by force. Heaven does not suffer the attacks of the demons, okay? Heaven has destroyed the, the kingdom of heaven has destroyed the kingdom of the devil. This means if you want the kingdom of heaven, you have to fight. You have to take it by force by fighting yourself and your sins. We are here not to be spectators, but to be on the front line, to uh, not live, as Pink Floyd sang, uh, to, to not to eschew our walk-on part in the war for a lead role in a cage from which you are here. That's what we're here to do. We're take our part in the war, even if it's short. Your sinful thoughts are not your friends. It's really important. Our thoughts are not our friends. We think that the noise and the stories and all this junk going around in our head is real. It's not real. It's just thoughts. Thoughts are not, hey, thoughts are not our friends. Be prepared to receive whatever teaching and counsel the priest gives you as from the Lord himself. Um, sometimes I say stuff in confession. I have no idea where it came from. I tell you, confession can be the most charismatic sacrament. It's just, 
the Holy Spirit sometimes says something. I have no idea what it's, the impact is going to be on somebody. And they take it and run with it. And I'm just, I don't know where it came from. And I don't know where it's going. But it does something. And people's lives are blessed. And that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah, Ambrose of Milan, the sinner, not only confesses his sins, but he even enumerates them and admits his guilt. For he does not want to conceal his faults. Just For just as fevers offer a hope of cessation when they break, so too the illness of sin burns on while it is hidden, but disappears when it shows itself in confession. So again, the approach to confession and sin and penance in the Orthodox Church is best defined in these kind of medical therapeutic terms. We understand that we're not, we're not here to adjudicate your case. We're here to bring you healing, the healing grace of God. That's our ministry. Be hard on yourselves. Don't make excuses. If you err, err on the side of too much responsibility, not too little. If you're taking too much responsibility on yourself for something, I will tell you. Say, that's not, that's not your fault. Or, you know, you can't control what other people are going to do. Maybe this person is just a jerk. It's not going to be your fault. Use de uh, definitive words, not possibly or maybe don't. Use I statements. That's another way of saying it. Um, you know, I did this, not... Because that, they, him, it, you know, sometimes you do this, you know, don't use it. Be precise. Speak the most embarrassing sin first. Just get it out there. You know, people will be like, I did this, I did this, I did this, 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 and then I spent five hours watching pornography. But then I did, you know, it's like, it's trying to slip it in at the last minute. <laughs> just, just start with that one. The worst one first, right? You go to the doctor. When you go to the doctor, you don't say, you know, yeah, I'm kind of I'm tired. I'm feeling a little woozy. Um, you know, I just don't feel myself anymore. And by the way, I'm hemorrhaging blood out my something, you know. <laughs> Start there. Do violence to the demon that's afflicting you. Tell it all. List the sins of necessary. Make a list, a laundry list. If you're worried about people finding your list, I, I always recommend use like little uh, mnemonic devices, little code words that will go, oh yeah, that's that, that's that, that's that. And then no one else will know what it is. Be regular, be succinct, be brief. Um, you know, again, don't make a production of it. Um, confession is not counseling. Some people will come and they will say, I want to come and talk with you. I want to do confession, but I want to talk with you. Realize that like if it's a Saturday night and there's 20 people wanting to get their confession heard, that's not the time to go into like a deep personal session. I'm happy to do priestly counseling for you. I'm not a licensed counselor. I have a doctor of ministry, but whatever that's worth, uh, you know, but I'm happy to meet with you as your pastor and, and help you. Um, uh, but make a separate appointment or an appointment that's dedicated just to you on an off time for that. And ask for the gift of tears. There's no greater feeling and blessing and cleansing experience than real tears of repentance. It's one thing to come and say, I did this, I did this, I did this, but I, just, I don't feel anything in my heart. I'm still hard about it. I'm still cold about it. I don't really feel sorry. Pray that God soften that heart and give you tears so that when you speak it, the water runs out your eyes. Those waters are the waters of baptism and will cleanse you most thoroughly and as definitively as the waters of baptism. Things to avoid, again, don't mention other people's sins or their mistakes or their failures. Don't praise yourself. I'm doing pretty good or I don't really have a problem with this anymore or I used to have a problem with that, but I don't really anymore. Well, you know, there's just setting yourself up for a re re relapse. So don't do that. Don't balance your sins with your virtues. You don't need to do that. When you look at your life, do look at that and give praise and thanks to God. If you see, you know, it's been a while that since I've had this issue, or I, I'm not as depressed as I used to be, or I don't lose my mind and get yelling at everybody anymore. Give thanks to God. Don't take credit. Don't take credit. Rank your sins. Don't rank your, that is, don't rank your sins. Don't evaluate your own progress. Don't sit there. I should be doing better. And so the devil comes and says, give up. Or I'm doing really good. So the devil says, take it easy, right? Don't try to be your own evaluator. We don't know. Don't be too general. Don't be too detailed. I don't need to hear all the gritty details. Again, I'm really good with euphemisms. 
uh, don't hide anything. Some people laugh or they giggle because they're nervous. If you did that in court, the judge would, would be like, what's the matter with your son? You know, they'd be like, this is a court of law. You, you shouldn't be giggling about this. Treat it as you're in the most important court of law that you will ever be. Even though I say it's not a court of law, it is the throne of God, right? So you have to be serious. Take it soberly. Uh, don't talk about other matters. If you have to talk to the priest about the bake sale coming up, or uh, you're, you wanted to know about coffee hour, something, something, or can you come do the house blessing? This is not the time to do that. Be focused on what you're there for. This is a serious thing. There's plenty of time to do that later. Wait, when you leave confession, don't go running off to the next thing. Spend some time in quiet. After I hear a lot of confessions, I don't talk to anybody. I go home and I bury myself in my room or somewhere. I don't talk to even my family or my wife because I've just come off of all that stuff. The same, take some quiet, take some quiet. Don't talk to others about what was said in confession, as I mentioned. Uh, we used to do confession uh, out in the church. When I first came, people, people were used to hearing the confessions in the middle of the church, and then everyone would wait down here. And then I found out when the people were waiting down here, they were chatting with each other. I said, that's not good. I want everyone in the church quietly thinking about their sins. And I'll hear your sin, I'll hear your confessions in the small room. And we changed that because there's just, it's not the time. Oop. St. Perfurier said, I want to see only one thing, my sins. Again, if you come to group confession, that's a great opportunity for self-examination through that. I know I'm running over time. Uh, if, you, if you know about what I did for my doctorate of ministry, I did a program called Repent and Recover in which I used the 12 steps of AA as a, as a, as a roadmap for how to repent. Uh, again, I just offer it to you if you want to know how that works. It really does put things in the right order. Some people, they think the repentance, they can jump steps. It doesn't really work. The 12 steps make sense because it actually fits the pattern of repentance as taught by the Holy Fathers, even though they didn't mean to. They kind of stumbled upon it through the crucible of experience. Um, some of them were influenced, but, but really they, they measured it on the basis of what worked in the fellowship. The first part is that repentance, recognizing that you're a sinner, that you need God's help and that God will help you and that you come to him. Second, confession. Make the inventory of yourself, admit to God and one other person, ask him to forgive you. Be ready to receive the forgiveness. Then the penance or the restitution, make the list of the people that have been wronged and hurt. Do what you can to make up for it. Don't do anything that will make it worse. And then lastly, ongoing repentance and growth, which is the parts of keep coming back, keep doing the same things, keep going deeper with your prayer life, and you'll grow. 12 steps make sense. It works if you work it. Uh, I think this might be the last. On spiritual fathers, the world today has need of good confessors, says Elder Paisios. Good spiritual fathers are few today, and the few that remain have to do their work in a hurry because of the many who go to them. Like a good surgeon who does many interventions and is wearied by the results so as to not give all as he should. If there were good spiritual fathers, there would not be so many psychiatrists. And I thoroughly believe that. The proof of authenticity of the spiritual condition of a father confessor is that while he is very strict with himself, he is very lenient with others and does not use the canons of the church, C-A-N-O-N-S, as canons, ba-boom, against them. We're not there to make anybody feel bad. We're not there to make anybody lose their hope or their faith or to despair. We want you to get better. And so we do what we can to get you on the right path. Don't be afraid. We're here for your salvation, not to fit the law, not to fit some rule, not to stroke our own egos. We're here to help your life in Christ. St. Porfirios says there is nothing higher than what is called repentance and confession. The sacrament is the offering of God's love to mankind. In this perfect way, a person is free of evil. We go and confess and we sense our reconciliation with God. Joy enters us, guilt departs. In the Orthodox Church, there is no impasse. St. Porfirios, modern saint. And that's it for today. Uh, we have Vespers starting in a few minutes, but if there's anybody who has 
uh, something they would like to ask 